I'm Paul Williams, and you're listening to The World is Wrong. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about Paul Williams. Not the songwriter or the rock critic or the architect. No, the other Paul Williams. Welcome to The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. I am one of your hosts. My name is Andras Jones, and today I'm your only host. In episode 34 of The World is Wrong podcast, we discussed the film The November Men. At that time, I had been unable to track down the film's director, but after the episode was released, he got in touch with us from the jungles of Brazil. This conversation is the first of many I've conducted with Paul Williams now. I've been working with him to build a website and podcast based upon his memoirs that I will be sharing more about in the future, and I hope you enjoy this rambling exploration of his life in and out of film, as well as about the November Men. This is a crossover episode with my other podcast, The Radio 8 Ball Show, so we begin with a musical divination that turned out pretty cool. I'll post the link to the full Radio 8 Ball episode in the show notes. Now, let's join my conversation with Paul Williams. I've been doing the Radio 8 Ball show for like 20 years, and as I was reading your book, there was so much uh, stuff that I thought there was like a kinship between a lot of the work you've done and the synchronicity and art aspect of Radio 8 Ball that it inspired uh-huh. me to... I've kind of had it on hiatus. It's, had, it's inspired me to, to bring it out, and I figure this is a conversation that might benefit from the addition of some synchronicity. Uh-huh to to get us going so not that it's not always there but hey sometimes the magic works as they said in little big man yes exactly it is true it's funny how much synchronicity is encoded into us through film without us being necessarily aware you know that when we're kid when i saw that scene when i was a kid i had this feeling of synchronicity about it but i didn't have the word or the concept but that's exactly what that is. Right. That's the pop oracle, all right? You do that. Okay, so all now, right. uh, so here's what we're going to do. So this is, a, it's a pop oracle that's full of every song that's been recorded in the history of Radio 8 Ball, including a whole bunch of my own. There's about 2,000 mm-hmm. songs in there. Each of them was recorded on a specific date, for the most part, mm-hmm. and as an answer to a question from a, pre- a previous musical divination. And uh, we've had some pretty illustrious folks ask uh, questions on the show. Uh, you know, Patricia Arquette and John C. Riley and... Uh, who else? We've had Alan Toussaint, Mose Allison, Dan Byrne. Dan Byrne. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's most. He's only played the music. He's never asked the questions. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, he, he's you know he's he's one of my good 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 old friends, and I know someone who has who's crossed your path a bit, and we can get into that. But this is for you to ask your question to the Pop Oracle, which will sort of. Uh, I hope, inform our conversation about the November Men and your career in film. So what is your question for the Pop Oracle, Paul Williams? Do I don't have to hit speak or anything? Uh, You could type it in or you could speak it. I'll speak it. Do I have to hit the speak button there? All right. Okay, now here's my question. Uh, Are the uh, unidentified flying objects coming from another dimension are the unidentified flying objects coming from another dimension well now uh give it a shake a shake shake the phone yeah the radio eight ball 
Let me die with my trumpet in my hand. Oh! Song number six. Song number six. And uh, this is a song uh, with Dan Byrne in common rotation. Consider me, Lord, make up your mind. Lord, I'm looking good, how I'm feeling good. Lord, who's a good guy? Lord, I bask in me, what you ask of me. Lord, I do it all the time. Just let me die with my trumpet in my hand. Lord, this tyranny. Oh, it's left to me, Lord, the melody out. Lord, the sinners we form the ministry. It's the surest game in town. Lord, you ready me, then call it blasphemy. But it's the only way I found. Just let me die with my trumpet in my hand. Lord, you tear us apart. Try to hide another heart It's a curse that is frozen to me You raised us in the middle Lord, you gave, I took a little It's so easily done Lord, can't you see we won? Lord, the china there Oh, the silverware, Lord, the way we would die, it'll be a sign. If you show me yours, Lord, I'll show you mine. Lord, you set it up, and now you knock it down. Lord, I'll gladly do the time. Just let me die oh, with my trumpet in my hand. That is yeah. amazing that that song came up. I want to know what you think about it in terms of the answer to your question about the UFO, about the UFOs. But I also want to tell you a little bit about how intense of an answer that is. Okay. So that was recorded on April 25th, 2010 at a theater in Seattle, Washington called Theater Off Jackson, and Dan Byrne was the musical guest, and he was there with his band Common Rotation. And John C. Riley was Skyping in, and the whole and it was one of the only times Dan has performed all of his Dewey Cox songs in one place, outside of a, a like an event for the film. And so John C. Riley was Skyping in to ask a question, which would then be answered by Dewey Cox music played by Dan Byrne that he wrote for the movie Walk Hard. 
And I I remember I was with Dan when he was uh, working on that. Yeah, it was. I remember that. So that pro, you know, that project was deep. He went really, really deep on the writing for that project. And as far as trying to really catalog the whole sweep of what of a life of music that that this character would have experienced from the 1950s through the present. At any rate, so I had this and this is all about I think this will kind of this is a great one to inform our conversation uh, about your career, because. For me, well, this this was one of those exciting things. I had John C. Riley, I had Dan Byrne, I had one of my favorite songwriters there. We were going to get to really go deep on Dewey Cox and on the movie. And by the time John C. Riley Skyped in, a couple of songs had been changed out because of the way we were doing it. Every time a song came off the board, we put another one on. And so when he asked his question, the one song that came up was one that Dan didn't perform at all. It was the one song he put in for his band, being the Menchie guy he is. He gave his band a chance to have their moment, and their moment totally became the moment because their song was the answer to John C. Riley's question. So <laughs> when that was played, there was this, mo- this feeling in the room of everyone questioning synchronicity, including myself, which I know is something uh-huh. that... Uh, I've learned I, the, this show has taught me you can't do. I mean, you can, we all do it. But the smart thing is to really trust that the synchronicity is right, especially when it feels so wrong and embarrassing. And what go, what's even better is that John C. Riley's question was a really profound question. And again, I think this may inform our conversation. He was, uh, he was asking a question about his mother who had just passed away. And he asked do our dead relatives see us and got this song as his answer. And mm-hmm. we could talk about how that we, on the show, we talked about how that answered it. And, you know, there was ways that we right. thought about that, but that it came up now when we were talking about Dan Byrne, you have a relationship with Dan Byrne. And then you got a song that was the most Dan Byrne song in it because <laughs> it's because Dan isn't in it at all. And it again just hammers home how wrong everyone in the room was that it was a bad reading because it's still a potent reading right now for your question about UFOs. So now with all of that context that I bring to it because I just I lived it, how do you think that song relates to your question about UFOs and other dimensions? Well... I must say, I think Dan, this song relates, uh, you know, he's such a, a skeptic, to put it mildly. Um, and what I find very interesting at this very juncture is the difference between, uh, you know, the consensus uh, reality that, you know, UFOs are, you know, silly, and the scientific uh well i just was talking to somebody at jpl and uh you know the best explanation they've got is that uh to have these characteristics you would have to be coming from another dimension it's as if i don't know if you know the movie or the book flatland a guy named morris yeah uh but you know, the point is, if you're living in two dimensions and somebody puts, comes through, all you see is a very small sliver of what that is. Well, similarly, these, you know, UFOs come in, they're seen, they disappear, they move at, you know, ridiculous speeds. Anyway, the, the interesting thing is, on the one hand, that serious, the most serious scientists now take it seriously. And... And of course, nobody knows anything, right? All they know is the uh, the, the fact that the, the verifiable data is there, that these things exist. What are they? What is their meaning? That's their speculation. But anyway, the, the, the interesting thing, I think, is going to be in June, this month, when they release some more, the Defense Department is going to release a huge amount of documentation. It's, it's just it's interesting to me whether it's uh, the moment of uh, 
balance moving the other way on skepticism. And in a way, that song we just heard was about skepticism. You know, if you know, if God won't play in my band, you know, let me play my trumpet, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so, in some ways, it's uh, it's uh, what would you call it? Uh, it's that very point of balance between uh, all the all and serious consideration for you know a whole new definition of uh, reality. Uh, so I guess in that sense, uh, this song identifies that moment. Even though it's not a Dan Byrne song, it definitely speaks to something that is a vein in his songwriting, which is, as maybe not unique to him, but is elevating the song itself to the highest form of expression. Like speaking to the Lord and saying all of these things, you call it blasphemy, but this is the, it's the surest game in town. This is the only thing I've found is to play my trumpet, to play my music. And, uh, and I guess when I think about, there's a part of like th thinking about there's a, a religiousness to the UFO phenomenon that is you know, whatever, I mean, I don't, and I don't mean it in the sense of that it's connected to any religion, although there, I think there are people probably who have a religious fixation either to them or against oh, them. Oh, listen, I just got a, I just got a serious letter from a person asking me if we could do the book of uh, the Mark from the Bible, uh, <laughs> where, where Jesus is a, uh, uh, <laughs> an ET in another form. <laughs> so, hey. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think, so there's, I think let, let's, I, what I'd like to do is, I feel like I'd like to let the, the reading sit, because we're going to get, I want to really get into talking with you about, uh, about your films, particularly about the November men. And I just have a feeling that this will come back over and over again through our conversation. Uh -huh. But if it doesn't, I don't want to stick around here too much because as much as I'd love to talk with you about UFOs, you haven't, you're yet to make a UFO movie. And what I want to talk with you right. about is the November men, a movie about assassinations. And I also think about, about making movies and about synchronicity and about the fluid nature of truth on film. Well, I mean, it's also tr true that on a certain level, my, my mainstream career was over halfway through my life. And then I really went on a much more personal tack and was just blowing my trumpet and doing my song and my films. And I yeah. didn't give a hoot what else anybody else thought, as long as I could play my trumpet. Well, actually, I didn't think I would start here, but it's been coming up in, uh, today as I've been thinking about talking with you. Because most of your films came out after the 60s. But when I really think about your work, you feel like one of the, like the, one of the most 60s filmmakers. Right. <laughs> In terms of what you have, the films, what, your, what the topics you've taken on, the life you've led, the choices you've made that may have taken you out of the Hollywood circles that you traveled in. And I think that continues right up to the November men, even though it's made in the nineties, I feel like it should be thought of as a sixties film because ah, the, right. the sensibility of it is still tr some, in some sense, trying to keep that alive. Am I, am I totally off base on this or do you think of yourself that way? Well, I think that in the 60s that were my really most formative years in the, in the filmmaking sense, but also they were my most formative years politically. Um, I mean, you know, from, from John Galbraith being my tutor in economics at Harvard uh, to uh, Eldridge Cleaver and Huey P. Newton, uh, you know, uh, working on uh, the Panther program. Uh, most of the criticism of society is as true today as it was then. 
It's just people went to sleep for about 30 or 40 years thinking everything was quite cool while, you know, the whole system degenerated and rotted into the incredible inequality and ruthlessness that it exhibits today. But all those things were very present in the 60s. And a lot of people, the weather people, the Panthers, all kinds of people were very clear about what was wrong with the economy and the society and the uh, uh, psychology of the country. And uh, it just uh, was, it just got rolled under uh, money. You know, they killed the Kennedys and they killed King and uh, everybody decided they wanted to go make money. And only after you get to, I guess, Marx predicted it, you know, the more mature stages of capitalism, uh, you're finding the system itself is becoming not only inhumane to most of the people on the planet, but is also killing the planet itself. So even though it might be born of the 60s, it's not that the world has changed so much as the world has been an experiment since then, which proved most of the propositions correct about the criticism of, uh, of uh, unbridled uh, uh, greed and uh, a desire for uh, fame. Uh, uh, that's what we were living, that's what we're living in. We're living in a very, uh, you know, sociopathic, corrupt uh, situation. And I don't believe it's anybody's fault. I mean, I think people's minds are created by the system. Uh, so yeah, you might say it's sixties, but I would say all these people today are just kind of ignorant of history and are very ignorant of economics. I mean, it's true that a guy like Keynes, who now is being accepted again, but do you realize that for 50 years, a graduate student in economics couldn't write a paper on Keynesian economics because it was so out of favor because of, uh, you know, the, the, the monetarists and the Republican, you know, uh, sensibility that uh, uh, made Keynes uh, persona non grata. So now we're finding out that he was pretty much right about everything. And uh, 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 everybody's discovering that they all went to sleep for 40 years and they let the society Inequality grew, lack of education. I mean, this whole Trump business was, uh, you know, it's just a growth of very angry people who have been left out of things and are uneducated and can't think their way out of a paper bag. So they've created their own uh, shadow. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but uh, there's some pounding going on behind you. That... Oh, yeah, Vivian. Yeah. Uh, they pick up that thing on the radio. Are you? They're picking up your chopping on the radio. It sounds delicious. It sounds. She says, she says it sounds delicious, but it, it's going on the radio. <laughs> okay, I'm done. All right. Okay. She says she's done. So, uh, we're talking to you now here in 2021, but if yeah. you can take us back to 1993 and the November Men, which already seems like it's many decades it's several decades past <laughs> the the point the flashpoint of what that movie's about i feel like the november men is about sort of somehow surviving the 60s or not well i mean to some, yes i i totally agree with you on the, the idea that it's like almost 30 years old now but uh i think you know everybody's uh, i just the the big change i think is that Back in the, back then, we realized how the systems work, and we were critical of the systems and trying to change the systems. And then people went into a very ignorant phase for two generations, really. And now the stresses of the society are manifesting in mass, uh, not mass, but just in individual people go instead of there being a movement there's just thousands of people going postal what are all these mass shootings about it's about it's about mental health being fucked uh 
you've got a you've got an entire society of, ne of highly neurotic people. Um, and and many. Wait a second! You're talking to a lot of my audience. A lot of my audience are these neurotic people. Just just so you know, we're not othering you. I'm one of you. I'm not going to go postal, <laughs> but just so you know, we're all we're all on a spectrum, folks. That make, that's yeah. what makes it a spectrum. Sorry. Yeah, but one nice thing about you know, if you really travel around the planet, uh, you'll see not everybody is like Americans. America, in the words of Pope John Paul II, is the most ruthless, advanced, industrial country in the world. It's the one with the least compassion. And that creates the greatest uh, problem for mental health. It's, you know, it's much worse than Europe. It's much worse than all kinds of places in terms of how the poor people have to live in the United States. It's a totally ruthless place. Yeah, yeah. Those are the words of Pope John Paul II, not mine. Well, you know, not. I don't need the Pope to tell me that. <laughs> I live here. Yeah. So uh, I think it's an. I think it's an incredibly volatile situation. But I also think it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Not so much because of the people, because people can be handled, but because it's you've got uh, you know a, uh, a war machine in America that is is constantly working, and uh, they're not going to. Uh, it's it's going to be a very strange thing that happens if the social contract continues to break down the way it is. How the reactions will go down. I just, uh, I'm glad I'm not there right now, frankly. And you are coming to us from? I'm coming to you from the Costa Verde, south of Rio de Janeiro, in the Brazilian jungle. <laughs> <laughs> you sent but me I have a internet. beautiful picture. It looks uh, like a good place to be hanging out. Well, it is. And I also, you know, the people here are all shades of color. There, it's you know they have a lot of the same problems of poverty and inequality, but the people themselves are not. Um, they're they still have respect for each other and compassion for each other, so it's really quite. A, it's almost like you're living in a small town. It's quite amazing. So you started in a small town, Massapequa. No, I started in the Bronx. Oh, you started in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, maybe yeah. I got that wrong. You you sent me a uh, an early draft of your memoir, and it sounds, at least from your telling of it, that even from the outset, you were sort of ambitiously coloring outside of the lines and trying to bring uh, unwelcome logic to illogical <laughs> situations. Is that yeah. a pretty a fair assessment of, of, yes. of how you got yes. started being an artist? Uh, well, to some extent, yes. I mean, my father was a school principal and a very uh, autocratic fellow. And, uh, you know, so I was very rebellious from a fairly early age. On the other hand, I was not rebellious in the area of achievement and being his surrogate uh, for his uh, for his dreams of success. So there was a real tension between those two poles, between being a rebel and also uh, needing to fulfill the unconscious desires of my parents. And not so unconscious, some conscious and some unconscious. In the book, like it sounds like a lot of your rebellions are, you know, like taking an extra job after school or making or playing baseball or it seems like some of the things that you got in trouble for were just also what could be areas that are where it could be seen as areas of success or productivity. When you say you're a rebel, it's not like you're sitting on the corner stealing hubcaps and oh, no, taking no, kids no, no, no. lunch money. You, you're like you're rebelling by. Well, I think of myself more as a spy. Yeah. You know, yeah. A... <laughs> That working from within. Well, I have the uh, the benefit of having read 
your memoir and you tell the stories so well there. Could you tell one example of one of the ways that went like whether it was with your with the jobs that you did or when you were in school running for office or like you have several different stories that are so clearly by the guy who made the November men. Like okay, the okay, rules okay, you're I, breaking I, I, in November can... men are right are already there when you're like 10 years old. Well, that's true. I was I was junior class president at Massapequa High School, and I uh, I love to play sports, uh, but uh, uh, in order to the only way you could be late for sports practice was if you had detention. Uh, that was an excuse so you could come late. And I needed detention in order to get my work done. I, thought, I mean, I had to get straight A's or I'd be in trouble at home. And so that gave me the freedom to disobey rules all day long because I needed detention every day. And I soon got it. I soon got detention for a whole year. And I still carried on. And they gave, started giving me double detention, which was even better for me. But... Uh, a detention after the detention uh, so I could get to practice a little later and do my my studies. But anyway, soon the teachers rebelled because they didn't want to stay the extra 45 minutes after the other 45 minutes. <laughs> but the, the key there is I got to meet most of the tough kids from high school. I was, I guess you call it, you know, from a middle class house, you know, cultured house. And a lot of these kids, you know, would not were a lot tougher, but I found I liked them very much and uh, they became my friends. I had all my detention friends and I had all the smart kids, too. So I had, you know, pretty much everybody. And uh, then, uh, well, there were two things. One was uh, there was going to be a class dance and there was always the class um, prom committee. So I appointed as president, I appointed half the kids, really tough girls, uh, to be on the committee. And that scandalized the school. It was a conservative Republican town. The kids, they, they were called the rocks back then. The rocks were not supposed to be on the prom committee. And they principals came and they told me, no, no, you can't do this. Blah, blah. And I said, what are you talking about? This is a, we live in America. It's a democracy. We, we can have all these kids. And it was a scandal, but I got the, them to work together. And, uh, and after a while they got to like each other. So then I guess, uh, I'm t I'll make this a much shorter story. So you don't have to make it short gonna, on my account. Tell the whole thing. Oh, well, okay. So then they, the administrators didn't like me, but then there was an, uh, an assembly you know, for the whole, you know, 600, 500 kids in the junior class. And for the first time they asked me to read the Bible at the assembly. I had never really read the Bible. And uh, so I found that, you know, great passage of, you know, take me to the fields. And, uh, you know, I found a, and I will, in the, when we are in the countryside, I will love you and give myself to you. I, I it was all, it was a wonderful uh, uh, sexual narrative from, I guess, Song of Solomon. And uh, I was very excited about giving this <laughs> speech. And I showed it to a kid who was standing with me on stage. I said, look at this. Did you know things like this were in the Bible? And uh, I don't, I guess he must have been religious. I didn't know it. But just before I went on stage to read the, the uh, passage, uh, the assistant principal came and ripped the Bible out of my hand and said, I'll read the Bible, go sit down. So the kid obviously snitched on me. Anyway, then I was running for president of the school like the week later. That's why I wanted to read that passage from the Bible. I thought it would make me very popular. Uh, and I knew I, I would win because I'm the only person who had both sides of the school. And this nice guy started running against me and lo and behold, he won. And it made no sense to me at all because I don't understand how he could have possibly gotten the vote. Anyway, later, um, the next fall, when I came back after the summer, this kid told me the principal and this guidance counselors had gotten him to run. 
And after the votes, I had one, but they uh, just announced he was the winner. So uh, that's, I ha I've had problems with authority most of my life. I don't like the powers that be. And yet you managed to, at least for a while, work with some very powerful people and be in, in relationship with, uh, again, going back to your memoir, telling people, I'm trying to, I'm telling you something to try and really trying to tell the audience that after you, like you said, you achieved a lot academically and you got yourself to Harvard at a particular time when, as you say, many of your professors would go on to be major shapers of, uh, I don't know, policy and, and culture going forward. And you, you yourself were a part of that wave. So do you want to take us to that and how that gets you into the film business? <laughs> well, I did want to learn how the smartest people thought and spoke. And I wanted to understand what they were saying. So I did make it a point to always take the courses with the greatest brains I could find. And that led me to some amazing people, uh, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr, Henry Kissinger, uh, George Wald. And, you know, and my tutor was uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who was the most read economist of the 20th century, wrote The Affluent Society, American capitalism, the theory of countervailing powers. And I loved the theory of economic uh, history, uh, the history of economic theory. And I just loved it. And one day I was in, we had lunch every Wednesday, with Galbraith and about five other, you know, sophomore economists who was, uh, had been picked to have lunch with the great man. And, you know, he was, Kennedy's advisor and uh, ambassador to India and uh, professor. And, uh, you know, he was uh, just a major figure. And one day he said, uh, uh, one Wednesday, he said, I hope uh, I want to invite a non-economist to lunch next week. I hope he said, all right, with you guys. And we said, of course. And nobody had to say anything. He was... He was, it was a rhetorical question, really. Anyway, the next Wednesday, we got there, and I sat down, and the non-economist was simply, by, by large measure, the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Uh, I couldn't believe how beautiful. I had never seen such a person in real life before. And he said, I'd like to introduce you to our non-economist today. Her name is Angie Dickinson. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she does done Rio Bravo with Howard Hawks. Anyway, I just was so knocked out and mesmerized by her beauty. I heard the voice inside my head say, whatever field this woman is in, go there. <laughs> so... In fact, he was bringing her to see John Kennedy at the White House. He was bearding for Kennedy. And, you know, she used to, you know, she was a pretty active woman. She said, I dress for women, I undress for men. Anyway, uh, that, that certainly propelled me in the direction of, uh, of beauty and film. I thought, this is, this is a great area. And that, that was my my first real life interaction with, um, uh, you know, that kind of uh, beauty and power. A film person. Yeah. Like a film, so someone who walked out of the film. I was interested in dating girls like Angie Dickinson. That sounded like a great idea. Well, and if they're, you know, hanging out with, you know, the larger story of like the sort of the the version of the apartment with Angie Dickinson and John F. Kennedy and John Kenneth Galbraith, I guess with Kennedy as the Fred McMurray character <laughs> and 
I don't know where you fit in. You're, are you the, so are you the sort of the Jack Lemon in this story or is Ke- John Kenneth Gal- Galbraith? I don't know. Um, uh, well, I'm not really in this story. I'm just, uh, you're I'm just, just the, you're the witness. The wall. Well, <laughs> yeah, a witness. Absolutely. Well, but it's an initiating moment for you. And as I, as you're telling this story, well, listen, you know, the truth is a, a bit later I was, uh, you know, I was quite, I was a very good photographer and, and, uh, as an undergraduate, they hired me to teach the photography course, uh, at Harvard. So I was, I was a pretty good photographer, uh, but I remember one day is standing at the Carpenter Center for Visual Arts, uh, you know, the head of the film department, film study department, a guy named Robert Gardner, a documentarian of the Dead Birds with David. Well, anyway, that's another story. He introduced me to Jean Renoir, the director. Uh, and I had a, this talk with Renoir and uh, he said, uh, you know, make sure you live your life. Don't get too immersed in movies. Uh, you know, you're going to start repeating yourself after your third movie anyway. Uh, and still, though, he was an inspiring character. Uh, you know, the Grand Illusion. And uh, anyway, he was a great guy. And uh, it was really that chat which made me decide, because it was the same day I got a letter of admission to Harvard Law School. And it was that same day that I decided to give law school a pass and try the movies. So there's another figure from the film business. So, but as you're telling this story, the the kid who runs for uh, runs for office and runs into what he did seems reflected in your first film, out of it, and then the story you're telling of being at Harvard as you're telling the story, I'm getting pictures in my mind from the revolutionary. Uh, is that again, am I, am I just projecting here or are those films pretty biographical? Well, yeah. I mean, the first film, it's very interesting. Out of it is a, a, about a kid in high school. It's based on my high school experiences who grew who, who, who goes through an evolutionary process socially. It's not, the story is about a change in consciousness. The guy at the beginning of the film is very different from how he is at the end of the film. And in fact, he turns towards the audience at the end and just looks at the audience for two minutes. I don't know if you saw the movie, but that's the end of the movie. You just, yeah. So then what happened next? Well, you know, I no longer believed in bullshit of, you know, this, uh, that world. And the next thing was, okay, well, let's try, you know, the, a, a level up. It was, uh, you know, a level of, uh, uh, what do you want, maybe anti-ethics or ethics. Uh, and yeah, I, it was, the next thing had to do with uh, uh, my period where I got very involved with uh, politics or revolutionaries. And then after, you see, it was, it was from Renoir. He always told me, he said, take time off. Don't go one movie after another, even though that's the way you should do it for your career. He said, live your life and then make movies about it. So, uh, and I always took off years between films and made sure I would live my life. And hey, as I, I didn't want to really be a writer. I wanted to be a character. I was definitely working on myself as my life was going to be an interesting life. You know, I'm not I wasn't trying to, you know, make a lot of money. I was trying to have an extraordinary life and find out what was going on here, because it was clear nobody seemed to understand what was actually happening. And so you could only see it. Like, I don't want to make it too far, but each stage of my life from high school to college and revolution, then to let's call it, you know, plain old, uh, you know, the whole drug culture and the ego uh, primacy. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I moved into the sp- spiritual realms with some of the highest Islam, the highest Islam on the planet. Uh, uh, same, I had the same teacher as the current 14th Dalai Lama, uh, a guy named Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche. But he's not just another Lama. He was, you know, if, if Oppenheimer created the atom bomb, and Einstein, you know, thought of it. It's like the Dalai Lama is Oppenheim, 
Oldtimer, and uh, Bilgo is Einstein. I mean, he he was an incredible, powerful being. Anyway, the films, I mean, Nunzio was really my attempt to try to make a spiritual film without talking about spirit at all, to put a kind of clear person inside of Brooklyn. Uh, but yeah, each of the films represents the next stage of my life. So if out of it is about... Oh, well, again, yeah, let me just finish it, because at the end of The Revolutionary, is the guy just looking at the camera again. He, we just come in on him. He's become a different guy at the end of that movie from who he was at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's pretty much the same thing in dealing. The guy looks out at the camera. I always had the characters look back at the audience at the end of the film. It's funny because I hadn't noticed that, but it's uh, John Avildsen who shot out of it for a long time. I felt like I was the only, maybe I'm still, but I felt like I was the only person and I needed to point it out to everyone who notices that so many of his films end with a character in freeze frame, like looking at, like, uh -huh. and... You know, I guess I, those are those are directorial choices, and I and from your standpoint, do you feel like was that conscious? Is this is this a thing of like I want to end my films with my films looking back at the audience? Absolutely, the first three films, anyway. Yeah, I wanted to say, what would I just go through? Did you, did you go through through it too? I I believed in stuff in the beginning of this film. I don't believe in it then anymore. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's true about of it. It's it, the revolutionary at the very end. He's come to the point where he has to kill. He, you know, he has to really come face to face with killing and his own probable death. God, he didn't know that at the beginning. He was just an angry radical. In that sense, I feel like the revolutionary connects most directly to the November men of any of your films. Although I feel like there's something in dealing. I feel like all of them there is, especially from those first three and then November men that feels very like a direct line. Like this could uh -huh. be the story of one. When I look, when I th put it together with you as a director, it feels like the story of one person's journey. And right. that journey is very much connected to not just your personal journey, but a, a cultural journey. Yeah, but it's always kind of, I mean, the November men happened because my daughter, who I was a single parent there for many years, you know, grew up under Republicans. She actually thought Democrats were, you know, uh, you know silly people and that Republicans were the only normal people. Uh, and I said, this is insane. I mean, I'm going to kill these guys. I started off thinking I'd kill George Bush. And only after a month, I decided I'd make a movie about it. Uh, it'd be safer for me and safer for my daughter. Anyway, so that's really how that movie was born. It was born just out of anger at the system, which had gone on for now over you know, 25 years of, you know, fucking over people so badly and claiming to be, you know, righteous. Well, you yes. heard our conversation with your writer and co-star on the November Men, James Andronica. And one of the things that he alluded to, but never, we never really quite got to, was he said that when I asked him where it all started with you, he said that it had to do with John Voight's acting class. And I, in reading your memoir, you spoke about uh, how powerful your experience with the Meisner repetition technique was. And was that, and was that all the same thing? No, no, absolutely. Not. Okay. Then help me. No, help I have to tell you that Jimmy, that Jimmy, I love Jimmy, but it, you know, the, before the November, I tried to get him to write a script about kidnapping uh, Bill Gates. <laughs> And, you know, like a, a little bit like that French film, Money, 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 Money. I don't know if you ever saw it. No, no. Uh, oh, it's a great movie. It's about a bunch of thugs in Paris who turn to kidnapping, political kidnapping, because there's no money left in the banks because everybody's using credit cards. And they couldn't care less about politics. It's just that's where the money is and ransoming rich kids. Anyway, 
so I thought that Ransom and Bill Gates would be a terrific movie. I mean, we would put them off. The, it was back then, you know, I realized, well, anyway. I, there was a, there were three or four different political ideas that I proposed to Jimmy, but he he uh, he's more of a traditional movie guy, and I don't think he really understood, frankly, the politics at all. He's he's a dramatist, uh, and uh, you know, it's actually, uh, this thing was had nothing to do with uh, Hollywood making this movie. I mean, actually, Steve Martin, did you ever see that Bowfinger? Yeah. Which was made, uh, you know, many years later. But that was my, that was the concept of November Man. I was going to go actually shoot these guys. Bush, Clinton. Uh, and I got in there. I got into the Republican National. I was in George. I was in, what's his name? Uh, I George got into Bush? the Republican convention. I was in the vice president's box, you know, and I had my camera person up in the stand. So shooting past me and past me was George Bush on the stage. That was for real. Uh, you know, the other time, you know, I, uh, when the Watts riots were happening, I made up fake IDs and I wrote to the White House asking permission to shoot the president. And they sent me back a letter on White House stationery saying, no way can you shoot the president. Uh, I made the movie, right? Anyway, it came to <laughs> the Watts riots erupts. Bush announced he's coming to L.A. You're talking about the uh, 92 Rodney King yeah, uprisings. Yeah. 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 And uh, so Bush says he's coming to L.A. I call the Secret Service. I say, I'd like to you know, photograph the, secret, the president. How do I do that? And they said, just show up at remote terminal three with ID and a letterhead and explanation. Anyway, I was there the next morning. It was ABC, CBS, and then my company, WWC, Worldwide Communications. And CNN and, you know, ABC were behind me. Anyway, we get in, they check our cameras. And I had memorized the, my dialogue beforehand about killing Bush. Uh, and they checked our cameras, and so we didn't have any guns. Then I showed them my IDs, which I had made the night before on my Mac, but they bought it. And then the final, the third ring, the third perimeter of uh, checking was, you know, a metal detector and uh, your press pass. And the whole White House press call was there. And I tried to go in with my camera person. And they said, oh, 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 it was Secret Service. said, you can't go in there. Look, you, you have to be official uh, White House uh, press corps to go in there. You're going to be 20 feet from the president. I said, oh, of course. No, no, I, we have special permission. And I pulled out my letter from the White House, which said, no way could I shoot the president. But it said the White House on top and signed by a guy at the bottom who was a real official. And I just held it up to the guy, the Secret Service. I said, yeah, I got permission. He said, oh, all right. And he let us in. <laughs> so there I was with the White House press corps, 23 from Bush, saying my dialogue. You know, they killed our guys. Now we're going to kill theirs. Squeaky from, she didn't know how to pull the trigger. Oh, well, but I said it without sound. I just moved my lips. And the Secret Service didn't know what to do. Because I was sitting there making these motions with my hand as if I was cocking a gun. But obviously, I had no gun, and uh, I wasn't saying anything. And then, as luck would have it, Bush came, and he exited right by me. So we're both in the frame at the same time. And I have Air Force One in the background. Uh, and then later, I, I looped in the, the dialogue. So that was the first scene. And I, I shot that before the movie, anything else in the movie. So that that you built the movie around a that's basically a kind of i don't want to say that it may may downplay it but you basically built the movie around a prank well a political yeah, prank no i was i was planning to make a guerrilla film about killing the president that's for sure right so it right. wasn't a prank but yes there was a, a fairly dangerous prank getting that shot right yeah 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 and i feel like that's so, okay so um 
I'm still at one of these days. For real. This is in Bowfinger. You know what I mean? This yeah. is really happening. One of these days, and, and maybe same... in this in this conversation, we will get back to that acting class because I'm so curious about it. But no. I let, let's let's stay on the November men. So so then you have this, and you have this working relationship with James and John. No. Everybody. Then what happened? No. Then what happened is that Tom Hayden gives a speech about the killing of Kennedy King, the Kennedys and King. And I, you know, I know he's going to give this speech and I go down there and I, I photograph him doing the speech, which is the second scene in the movie, you know, where he talks about their killing our guys, that three lone gunmen miraculously killed all the leaders of the left, ruined our generation. That was the second thing I filmed. And it's with those two things, with Bush and with the Tom Hayden speech, that we built the thing around that. And your camera person on this was Susan Susan Emerson. Emerson. And sounds like, again, I only going off of uh, what James said, and that there was that you were a pretty tight little production group like she was right. like in a small production like that nobody is just like i'm just the cinematographer everyone's sort of like doing everything you're collaborating right. actually susan has was a wonderful painter and had terrific composition uh, and had a very she was a very good operator and set decorator but she didn't know that much about photography so I took care of a lot of the lighting and the technical end of the camera work. The film does have a, and I, I like this. It's one of the things that grabbed me, but a slightly schizophrenic visual style, just in the sense that some shots are just so gorgeous. And then some are just there. Uh, I rem right. There's this, this uh, setup in the, in the, I guess it must be the garage right before you get killed, the big showdown. Like that's so, it's like, that's like shot out of a great 90s action film. And with a little kind of artsy. And then there's these scenes where you just sort of like, it's, and it's one of the things I like about it. It makes me feel like some of this movie is a movie and some of this movie is just being, just people hanging out in front of a camera, even though it's all a movie. Um, was right. that, was there, I'm sure it wasn't entirely intentional from the way you describe it, because that's just what you're working with. But at some point, did you take that on as being part of what, as, as part of the voice of the film? Well, it, for me, there were always multiple realities going on. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain scenes that are definitely set up like movie scenes. And there are other scenes that are, you know, the, the, kind of the premise is that you can get away with murder because it's, it's such a guerrilla film and that we what is real what is not real what is just the personal goings on between these people and what is the film uh, all the th i mean it's very i think fairly clever that way. are there any other films like this no absolutely not this is the that's the that's the wonderfulness about making such a low budget stuff you can just you're not you're not confined by uh you know the conventions at all you know i've made i've made a bunch of films like that many of nobody's ever seen i made one about tantric yoga tell us about this tantric yoga film that you made that has never been seen because i feel like everyone's ears just sort of like woke up a little bit could tell us about this well nothing i went and, and i've always loved sex and been interested in it i mean my I got a summa cum laude at Harvard for my thesis on the expressive meaning of body positions in the male-female encounter. Um, so anyway, it's definitely been one of my favorite. It's probably the, the area that I love the most. Um, and when I discovered that there's a whole realm of sexuality beyond, beyond anything we in the West uh, know about, I was fascinated. And uh, I went to study with some uh, tantric uh, teachers, and uh, it was extraordinary. I mean, I think if we get taught tantra to kids in elementary school, we'd have no war. No one would want to die rather than have sex. Uh, 
But in any event, uh, I thought the Tantra stuff was really remarkable. And I went back there a year later with a, actually with a, a friend of my daughter who was HIV positive and a very good looking young man who women were propositioning all over the place because uh, he was so beautiful. But, uh, you know, he was HIV positive. And so I thought we'd make a film about his going to learn Tantra so that he could enjoy sex and, uh, you know, uh, the ecstasy without endangering a woman. Can I? If he uh, had HIV. Just, yeah. I want to just dig in on one, on just, a, just the, the wording, because I think you're on the verge of saying it and, but, uh, uh, maybe that's because I've studied Tantra as well, that I'm hearing it that way, that when you're talking about sex, you're not talking about intercourse. You're not talking, I mean, you might be talking about intercourse, but you're talking about. Well, I, my notion of sex yeah. definitely always included intercourse. I never realized the realms uh, right. uh, short of ejaculation, which could be investigated. It's almost like the higher realms of Buddhism. Yeah, it is. Or the lower realms in the sense that, but in, the, in, a, in a circle, you know, and there's no, there's yeah, no hierarchy right. of realms in terms right. of uh, the human body. Uh, right. So you saw so the, the film, what was it called? It was called The Best Ever. The Best Ever. And did you get to the point of, you made this film? Uh, we made it and it was shot on video but it was a feature film. And when I showed it to a few people, like for example, Henry Jaglum, this was a long time ago, you have to remember too, this was like before sex on the internet made everything, everybody know everything. <laughs> this was still prior to internet uh, porn uh, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so when I showed it around to people in Hollywood, they thought it was pornography. <laughs> well, strangely enough, we showed no genitals in the, in the film. It was more about techniques and uh, uh, point of view and, uh, yeah, all kinds of, you know. Who was in it? A fellow named Richard Hillman, who really was HIV positive. And Tara, what was her name? Uh, Tara Gold who was, in fact, a Dakini and an actress. So I had the real people. I had a real guy with HIV and a real tantric uh, Dakini. The, and she really did fall in love with him during the shooting of the film. So it was quite remarkable. And why is it not available? Well, the, the other thing about Richard Hillman Jr., who was in the film, uh, had a father, Richard Hillman Sr., who put up the money for the movie. And uh, he basically put the kibosh on the thing. You know, he was a rich guy and uh, he uh, didn't want the thing out there. Because of like fear of outing his son? I suppose or? it's not good. To, you know, he was a McKinsey and Company guy. I mean, he was a, I suppose he didn't want uh, the world to see him in this this way, and his son had then I mean terribly terrible you know overdosed and died some years later. Wow. Uh, and what year was it that you made the film? Yeah, what year was it? Because God, look at the book. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, the reason I'm asking it? is because in the November Men, there's that whole scene where you're auditioning people and you're like. There's a oh, whole yeah, bit about needing to hire an, right. an actual an actor who actually right. is HIV positive. Is that right. are, is is are you riffing? That's are you making reference. fun of yourself for this yeah. or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the Tantra film came before the November Men. Yeah. And you say you shot the Tantra film on video, and I know that you started the November Men on video, but. Well, I think I know. Again, you can correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. And then no, no, the Bush and the and and uh, 
Hayden were on video. And then you decide, and then I guess, didn't you shoot a scene or two and then decide, hey, this is too good. We got to make this on film. Yeah. Good choice. I'm glad. I mean, I think, although I think my co-host, Brian, might actually argue that if the film looked shittier, it would even be more yeah. dangerous. But I don't agree. I love, I love, I love the cinematic, the sort of, the 90s cinematic quality or late 80s, early 90s cinematic quality to it. Oh, yeah. No, I wanted, I, I listened to your podcast about it. And I, I guess, did you, if did you should find out the truth about, uh, Robert Davi from the from my book about how he came to be in the film. Yeah, yeah. No, we were done. We were finished. We were selling it at can. You and added those scenes. No one would buy it without a name. So um, I called Davi on the. Jimmy called Davi and he said, "Yeah, he'd do two scenes if he could be on a horse and one and shooting skeet in another, and if I'd bring him two boxes of Cuban cigars." So. We ended up being able to sell the film in Cannes, saying he was in it, and we got our money back. Uh, but uh, and then we went back and shot the scenes and put them in the movie. So Davi was, and, but of course it was written cleverly. So you, you know, the idea that he was paying for the movie and don't tell anybody. I mean, it was a lot of fun. It's the onion-like nature of this that, <laughs> on its own, it's funny and sort of messes with your equilibrium as a viewer but then knowing that the film well again knowing that the key elements of the film being those shots of Hayden and of Bush and then the Davi stuff that some of the most important stuff happened before the film was made and after the film <laughs> was totally done and right. it all fits together that it all fits together right. cohesively not again like there is this fractured visual sense but that it fits together cohesively to give you that feeling that uh, of of synchronicity and conspiracy and paranoia and also this other like like well it's all in that Hayden speech the heartbreak that's in that Hayden speech uh resonates through the whole film yeah but I mean we do films like the secret service guy and the crapper you know and, yeah well uh, <laughs> that's also <laughs> I mean yeah I, I was also thinking, and again, I, I, I'm always aware that there's as soon as I know something, I'm likely to project it onto films that I'm watching. But there is something Meisner-esque about that whole way of the, what we're just describing, of you just start and you don't really know where it's going to go. But as long as you stay true to the exercise, it'll be interesting. And also trusting yourself as a filmmaker at that yeah. point. So. I'm kind of curious about the collaborative quality, like you and James and Susan, how did that all work just as a crew? And as like, is, are you, as you, since you're coming up with it as it's going, are you going to James? Well, that, to well, Jimmy that, no, we, that thing was written before we started, you it, know, that is to say, once I had those two scenes and I called Jimmy and we, you know, and this, he started working on the script. So then he wrote everything that's there except what's added with Davi. I, I mean, yes, by the time and, he and the, well, and then I think I'm trying to remember. I think I'm in the film, and I give some pretty long speeches about the nature of this. Uh, yeah, the political uh, stuff that's going down and. Jimmy and Susan and uh, frankly, everybody working on my crew had no idea what was going on politically and they couldn't stand my political speeches, which got me very upset. And they actually got me to cut them way down. And I'm really sorry because everything I said came true and everything I said was a fact, uh, you know, and, and that's unfortunate. So it was definitely a, what I call a working class the sensibility that was involved in the film. And I was working with people who, you know, in general were not highly educated. And your first time working with James Andronica was on Nunzio. 
can you talk about that experience? Because that's a film that when we started doing this podcast, I was totally unaware of and was in research in researching this that it came up. And since then, as I've talked to people about you, I feel like I found that that film actually does have this sort of well of love out there for it. Um, can you oh, yes. talk about it a little bit? Well, yeah, I mean, again, see, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Like Jimmy wrote Nunzio, okay? I didn't even know the guy. And they brought me the script and I read it, but I had just spent a year. Well, let me just think. I spent a year studying with Bilgo Kense Rinpoche, uh, doing the highest Buddhist meditations. And, uh, and then, oh, also I had studied with uh, Oscar Chazo at, uh, for quite a while. And when I read Nunzio, I said, oh, I really wanted to make a film about uh, essence and ego. But you couldn't possibly make such a film in the United States. You know, it's, uh, nobody would go to it. And I thought Nunzio was a possibility that if we took the idea that Nunzio was a man be, beyond ego, you know, who was just a very direct, uh, un, unspoiled uh, energy that had to deal with the incredible neuroses and uh, complicated egos of a bunch of Brooklyn, you know, middle class, lower class people, it would be a great way to show the interaction of ego and essence. And I explained that to David, and he didn't really understand that very much. David Provost. And of course, Jimmy, yeah, and Jimmy thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, and uh, then I guess a friend of, I had a very good friend who had been a monk and knew a lot of the high lamas and make a long story short, I brought David to see the black hack Karmapa when about two weeks before we we're going to start shooting. And David, we explained to the Karmapa that David was going to play a guy who was mentally challenged, but evidently the translator told the Karmapa that he was mentally challenged. Anyway, my idea for the movie had been that I would have Joel, the monk, sit in David's trailer. And I would have David look into the monk's eyes in between the scene, in between takes and between scenes. He'd just be on a meditation with this high monk. And David said, you know, forget it. Go fuck yourself. I'm a Meisner guy. You know, I don't need any of this crap. And uh, so about two weeks before we started, uh, we invited him up to see the Karmapa. And as I said, we, he was introduced to someone who was, who was mentally challenged. Anyway, David did his walk for the Karmapa. And then the Karmapa brought him over and had him sit in front of him. And he started blowing on the back of David's neck for about two minutes and uh, gave him a, a Dave, well, and gave him a, a very deep blessing. Okay. Then when we got down onto the street after we were done, David said to me, fuck you. There are no llamas in my, in my trailer. Yeah, I'm going back to Brooklyn. And I went to my parents' place in Manhattan. And about 11 o'clock at night, I, I was, I didn't know what I was going to do. The only reason I was making this movie was to try to do this interchange between these two different, very different types of energies. And David got on the phone. He said, Paul, I've been playing basketball from seven o'clock this evening for four hours. I did not miss a shot. Not one. I never missed a shot. You understand? Joel can sit in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a true story. And we had Joel sit in the trailer. So are there 
when you're talking about it, and this is one of the things that uh, that strikes me about your whole filmography, that a lot of times there'll be a film that you've made and it'll remind me of another film that I think of as being, you know, an older film, foundational for me, but still came several years after your film. So there's a part of it when you're talking about this that it makes me think of being there, makes me think of Brother from Another Planet. Are there films like that were touchstones for you before well, yeah. making I Angel? Tried to, I, tried, I tried to get Ed Pressman to buy Being There for me. <laughs> I thought that was a great, great book, and I could have done a great, great job with it. He, he wouldn't do it. You do have, like, as a filmmaker, that uh, that I could see that. I could definitely see that. I mean, Hal Ashby is pretty is pretty good. Did you ever work with Hal Ashby at all? Did you come? Did you cross paths? I didn't. I didn't. The closest I got to Hal Ashby was I still remember the day John Voight was sitting in his little office in his rented house, and uh, what was that film? Coming home. Yeah, Ashby directed him in Coming Home. Yeah, and so John was, we were talking, and he says, you know, I don't know if I should do this film, you know. And I said, are you kidding, John? You get to play the film in a wheelchair? You got so much Catholic guilt going on. that This movie was made for you. Anyway, so he did the movie, and they all won a lot of awards. But that's as close as I intersected with Hal Ashby. Well, that gets us to Voight, who you worked with on The Revolutionary and Out of It. It's funny because in your book, you say that you wanted Voight for the Barry Gordon role. And oh, I yeah. got to be honest, when I'm watching The Revolutionary, I want Barry Gordon for the for the Voight role. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> That's funny. But you had a so it's but you had a rich actor director collaboration for a time. Oh yeah, no, I I love John. I thought he was an amazing talent, and uh, I really I, I I thought he was great. I thought he was a wonderful wonderful actor. The truth, the problem with John was that he's really a character actor, and uh, he didn't want to be a movie star. Really, he he's a very serious guy. God knows what happened to him in his later life. We won't get into that. But when he was a young man. I really, I don't want to say that I enjoyed his character in uh, in Out of It because he's kind of such a jerk, but he's great in that. And and seeing him that early in his career, I think that's the earliest Void I've ever seen. Had, yeah. had he made many films before that? No, he made one film before that, a horror movie, I think, called Frank's Great Adventure. And then there was an acting class that John Voight led that you were a part of. Yes. Yeah. Right after I, I had this amazing teaching from Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, in which I won't go into it, take a while to tell, but basically where he eliminated all thought from my mind uh, without my having to do anything. And he also sent me on a distant seeing trip. So I was in another part of the globe. Uh, like a remote viewing? Like remote viewing, yeah. I was in India, but I was in Manhattan. And I'm sophisticated in terms of uh, how the brain and the eye work. So I, when I was there, I tested parallax and uh, I did all kinds of tests to in other words, if it's an hallucination, you can't turn around in it, okay? And parallax does not work in the hallucination either because the images are coming from your brain. Uh, but if the, if the images are coming in through your eye, they'll follow the rules of optics. And so I would check, I checked it out very carefully when I was in the distant viewing situation. Anyway, when I finished that teaching with him, he did something. Oh, you're interested. Is there something called tantric theater? And it's basically a technique where uh, the very highest lamas can eliminate your thought. It took him about two hours. And every time I came up with a brilliant idea, he would make it disappear. 
And at the end of that session, I was clear as a bell. I realized that that's where East and West met, that actors express whatever they're feeling in order to stay empty. And in the East, they detach in order to stay empty. But the place of emptiness is the same. It's the difference between detachment and expression. So after finishing that episode of tantric theater with the Dilgo, I decided, oh, I'm going to study the Meisner work. And I came back to LA and uh, told John, and then he organized a class, which David Proval was in. It was David Proval, me, Susan Martin, and Lisa James, and John. There were five of us. And John was the teacher. Wow. Wow. And we and we did that for, uh, you know, I don't know, eight months. And it was a great training. So I could describe it, but could you just describe how well, I can only describe my Meisner class. Can you describe how like how the Meisner class worked? Well, it's a repeat exercise where, where people simply you're something like you're wearing blue jeans. The I'm other wearing blue says, jeans. I'm wearing blue jeans. You're wearing blue. It goes back and forth. And you, the reason you do it is it's like an Eastern mantra. It's to stop your mind from thinking of words. Yes. So that you can put all your attention on your feelings and just express what you're feeling in the vibration of your speech. And your mind is taken up with just blue jeans, blue jeans. So you could say, I love you. I hate you. I want to kill you. I want to marry you. All in Forever you're wearing blue, blue jeans. jeans. Right. So that's basic. Basically, it's a technique of getting out of your own way and learning to uh, letting your feelings be, have primacy. Now, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me, most interesting about the Meisner technique, is that Pacino. Chris Walken, Dustin Hoffman, John Voigt, Bobby Duvall. They were all in the same class uh, at Neighborhood Playhouse when they weren't famous. De Niro, So maybe too, they right? were... No. No, not De Niro. No, not De Niro. And that's another story. The, oh, that's another... I won't get into that right now. But no, definitely not De Niro. Uh it's funny because I feel like De Niro is the actor who kind of broke Meisner in you know, in both meanings of it, the, in both sense of the meaning. Because he's such a great actor, he sort of de demonstrated it. That in Taxi Driver, that repetition with himself has been done and parodied so much that in a way it kind right. of broke it, but in another way it also associated it so much with him that that's why I made that leap. But what you're saying, and this is uh, yeah. actually much more important, is that at the Neighborhood Playhouse, and this is in New York, uh, the the people you listed are basically the great actors for the most part of the 70s, minus a few uh, notable exceptions, yeah. but there's something about all of them. Men, the men males. Yeah, you're right. Yes, good correction. Um, were th was it? Were there any women that came out of that class? Well, the, uh, none that. Uh, uh, well, what was her name? Was Susan Terrell a part of that? Yes, Susie Terrell was. And I'll tell, I'm, I got to remember that. You see, I can't remember her name. There's the the girl, the redhead, and the the revolutionary was also in that class. Um, His girlfriend at the beginning of the movie. I'll try to. Remember. Um, anyway, but you know, the one thing I find very interesting technically, I don't know if you, you might be interested in this. Did they ever teach you the check in the Meisner work? The check. Yeah. That before you do see in the original neighborhood playhouse and in the pure teaching, they had something called the check. One of the most important things that you were taught was to review the prior 24 hours. 
and just leave yourself alone. You ask yourself the question, you know, what was emotionally most important to me in the last 24 hours? It might have been getting sauerkraut for your hot dog. It might have been leaving your kid because you had to go to acting class. It might have been losing your wallet, you know. But you have to see, you don't review your day. You just go empty and see what is emotionally most important that rises in your head. That's the check. Because then whenever you're doing a scene, you don't have to pull up the emotion like Stanislavski or any of the other. It, you don't have to go back further than 24 hours to find the emotional stake in the scene. You follow me? In other words, let's say I want to get this shirt off your back. And let's say today that what was very emotionally important to me was uh, a little a three-year-old friend of mine who went to the hospital. I don't know what, how she is. Okay. Uh, okay, so if I have to get this shirt off your back or whatever I said it was, I can say to myself, okay, if I don't get this shirt off his back, that little girl's going to die. All right. That's very heavy, but I don't have to manufacture it. It's part of my day for real. You follow? Yeah. So you never have to pretend in a scene. You follow? Oh, totally. When Pacino. Okay. Now, did they teach you that in the Meisner? It's funny because the Meisner class that I was in, the main focus that the teacher had us on, that was there, but not as not as specifically as you're as you're giving it. What he his main focus was that your focus that you never have to worry because it's all with the other person with like uh, it's uh, not no. you're not focusing on what you're saying, that the focus becomes my yes. my scene partner. And that that yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, to me that, that's that was the... the part that like that really it became it was actually I think of it as one of my first tantric classes like that is a right, tantric exercise the repetition exercise yes. you're sitting yes, across from someone you and you're that... feeling them and their boundaries and you're speaking right. to each other without like energetically right you're picking up each up on each other energetically right. uh, why it's so powerful yes, but now the quite I, I mean it's, it, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's an incredible experience to learn what you're feeling. I mean, the most difficult people to train are highly educated people. It sometimes takes them six months to make a sound mm -hmm. that sounds real. Uh, you know, but the thing I find interesting is that they don't teach people to check. And that's, that's how you use Meisner if you're really in a movie, <laughs> if you're really doing a scene. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. You, you, you use what's going on in the scene, but you have something at stake in the scene to give, so you can get what you want. You follow? Yeah. It's uh, it's what my dream psychologist father would call the day residue. Like when you're trying to, right. think, trying to talk about a dream, it's like, well, what happened to you yesterday? Because probably that's right, what exactly. the dream's about. It's not about what exactly. happened to you when you were two years old. It's what happened exactly. yesterday that made you think about when you were two years old. That's right. It's the emotionally active stuff from the prior 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, see, but the thing that amazes me is the number of people I've met who've studied Meisner don't know what the check is. That because is, that's yeah, the way that's... You apply that, well, that's the way you apply Meisner if you're on a set, you know, or if you're, you know, if you, or if you're, you know, on a show. It's and I think maybe it's the Meisner acting teachers not wanting to lose their teeth, their their students, because if you teach the check, who who learned the check, Pacino and Walken and Hoffman and Boyd, they all knew that. It's a fairly simple little thing, and it doesn't get taught. And now our listeners know it. You've let the cat out of the bag once again, Paul. <laughs> You're you're playing that trumpet of yours. Uh, the actress was Jennifer Salt. Is that right? No, Jennifer played the the female ingenue lead. He le breaks up with a girl, the redhead, in the beginning. Colin Paxton, no. Anne, who played Anne. Yeah, Anne. Yeah, Colin or Colleen Wilcox. Oh, Paxton. Colin. Yeah, Colin. Yeah. 
What was what who was her last name? Paxton. Yeah. Colin but Paxton. but that film you got Seymour Cassell, Robert Duvall, and John Voigt. And this is one of the things that I guess I want to shift a little bit here because Wait not- a second. I ended up with I ended up with Seymour Cassell because ten days uh, I had Al Pacino to play Seymour's role. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, on 10 days before we were getting shooting, his agent calls me, Stevie Phillips, I still remember, saying we he won the uh, Tony for a play called Tiger Wears a Necktie. And she said, we don't want uh, Al playing second fiddle to John Voight. That was, you know, and I had spent time with Al and he had the character down perfectly. He knew Abby Hoffman. He had the voice. He had everything. Anyway, so Seymour was, we had to get him in a rush. He had been in Faces and, you know, it's not that Seymour isn't a wonderful actor, but he is not uh, in any way uh, an intellectual or able to play an intellectual which is what the character, even the character was an Abby Hoffman character. And he had the big speech in the movie where he's supposed to give the ideological basis of the whole film. And we came, he just flew into town, we threw him on the set and he couldn't make head or tail of the dialogue. So I had met him uh, earlier in the day at an office and we were in an elevator. He tried to pick up this woman in the elevator by putting his head on her head and uh, trying to pick her up. And they used a Donald Duck voice trying to pick her up. So when we got on the set, you know, hundreds of people, we have to shoot the scene, blah, blah, blah. And he can't make any sense of the key dialogue of the movie. So I had to say, okay, say it all in your Donald Duck voice. It'll work in kind of a theatrical way, you know, funny. But, it, you know, the film lacked a certain substance at the end. Well, yeah, to think of a, of a young it, Pacino the, playing Abby, an Abby Hoffman type character, that's why do you put that in our heads? We wouldn't have known that it was film was missing that if you didn't tell us now. Oh, well, I'm so old. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's OK. I, yeah. um, well, you did. I mean, you do have Robert Duvall in there. Was he was there someone else you wanted for the Robert Duvall role or was he always? No, no. He was all. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Robert Duvall was, actually, I made a, a, a documentary film about a little French village uh, a summer that I was at Harvard. And when I got to New York, Stanley Kaufman, the critic, had a TV show. And he put that film, it was called Chanzo, about life in this little French village. And he showed the whole film, it was 15 minutes long, on his half hour show. And he spent the other 15 minutes talking about how bad Hawaii was, George Roy Hill's film, and said because it didn't do what my film did. And it was, you know, I was a kid. Anyway, the next night I went down to the HB studio because I figured I better learn something about acting if I was going to direct a movie one day. And uh, he had seen Stanley Kaufman's show the night before and seen the movie, which he loved. But he and Uta Hagen, his wife, took me under their wing for a year, teaching me acting. And the very first person I saw work down there was Robert Duvall. Do a scene, I remember, still remember the scene he did. He was in a cabin, all by himself, mountain man, for 20 minutes, and he never said a word. And he was riveting, absolutely riveting. That's when I learned that there was a lot to be known here about acting. So had you met Abby Hoffman by the time you did the Revol- you made the revolutionary? Because I know he shows up in your life after the fact after that. No, I did not know Abby before I made the revolutionary. So it was mostly that character was based upon the the sort of media persona of an Abby Hoffman. Right. Right. type character right um after talking after reading your memoir it made me want to go back and watch drive he said and there's a <laughs> abby hoffman type character in that one as well it seems like a lot he i feel like the effect 
impact or the impact he had as sort of a celebrity or an icon for uh, for that generation of artists, it gets overlooked a lot. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your take on Abby Hoffman? In his heyday, he was great. Well, he was, you know, very smart. He knew his economics. He knew, he knew, uh, he, he, was a, he was a very knowledgeable guy and very theatrical and understood theater and understood media. And so he embodied the movement in a wonderful way. When he spoke, he was intelligent. When he behaved, he was effective. And he was a lot of fun. And he was ballsy. He was great. I mean, in later life, he became nuts. But that's another story. Could you have seen directing a movie with Abby Hoffman in it? No. Well, you mean after I knew him? Well, yeah. I guess maybe that was after he got crazy. But No, once I met him, I, it was fairly late. He had had... You know, Abby was a good-looking guy, but he was on the 10 most wanted list uh, for the FBI. Yeah, that can take a toll and, on a person. Yeah, well, but he also had his uh, a nose job to make his nose big, so no one would recognize him. He went by the name Barry Freed, and he was nuts. He was crazy, and uh, although he was even in fact, he testified at the Moynihan hearing on the St. Lawrence Seaway as Barry Freed while he was on the 10 most wanted list and got the Senate to agree to stop the Army Corps of Engineers doing this stuff in the St. Lawrence Seaway. But anyway, later when the, everybody went and decided to make money and the movement sort of died, he, he had no, he, his ego was so caught up in the movement. It, it was his death, frankly. You know, he didn't, he couldn't move beyond uh, uh, his concept of himself as this 60s radical guy who had to be, you know, number one. Uh, so he had an ego problem, which eventually led to his death. So. Well, he, and he's not the only sort of political, uh, I don't know icon or celebrity of that era that you had, you know, that you worked with in some way or had interactions with in some way. Uh, you talked about your uh, connection. You sort of referenced your connection to Eldridge Cleaver and to Huey Newton. Do you want to talk about your relationship to the, to the Black Panthers? I was married. I was married to a woman. It's funny. When we started going out, I had no idea who she was. She was just cute and sexy and smart. And later I found out she was, you know, one of the richest, I think one of the richest families in America. And uh, I got along very well with the family and her father. And he even offered to buy me a movie studio one time. But uh, the big moment came when the, uh, there was an 11-year battle in the Supreme Court the people of the United States versus Western Union and Western Union International. And my father-in-law owned both those companies as well as many others. Um, well, they originally had Sears Roebuck was their company. Anyway, uh, but anyway, I still remember there was a three, a banner headline, three, three line banner headline, which is as big as the New York Times ever gets saying Supreme Court rules against Western Union International must divest itself of, you know, satellite communications. Because what happened is Western Union owned all the cables going to Europe. And uh, Western Union International owned all the satellites. So they had a monopoly on communication between North America and Europe. And so there was an 11-year antitrust suit against them, and eventually they won. And that was the headline in the New York Times. So I remember going over there that morning. It was a Sunday morning, and I said to him, okay, Bill, I got you now. And I held up the newspaper, and he laughed. He said, come with me. And we went into this small back room at his house, his apartment, 
and uh, closed the door. And he got on the phone and dialed the number and said, hello, Sid? Yeah. Did you see the New York Times this morning? Yeah. I'll tell you what. You take the satellites, I'll take your steel mills. All right. You send your guys up on Tuesday, I'll send my guys down. All right. Thank you, Sid. Sorry to bother you Sunday. And he hung up. That's when I became radicalized for life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it just blew my mind. Uh, this whole democracy thing is just a theatrical uh, show that's put on by people who own the show. Um, and so I looked around to see who were the people who seemed to me had the most valid response to the ruthless oppression that was really a product of people nobody could see. Um, and I thought it was and that, that day that J. Ed Gahuba came out with a big thing in the New York Times saying the most dangerous radical organization in the country were the Black Panthers. And they were the greatest threat to the American system. So I thought, okay, that's, I'd like to go, I'm going to find out about these guys. So uh, uh, I had a friend in New Haven who knew the area captain there, a guy named Don Cox. And we went up and we shot some footage of the uh, demonstration in support of Bobby Seale. And I talked to him. I said, look, I'd like to make a film about you guys. Uh, but I want you to tell me what to make it about. I just, I'm going to be your tool. And I'm going to pay for it. I just want to be uh, the honor of serving. And they said, okay, well, you can work with Newsreel. I said, I'm not going to work with anybody else. I don't want to work with a bunch of white guys. I said, do you want to make this movie about what you what you believe in? You don't want I don't want a white guy's point of view about what you believe in. Uh, and they said, OK, right on. It was Big Man East said it. Uh, and so within a couple of days was Kent State where they started shooting kids on the campus. Uh, and then uh, Big Man, just the day before Kent State, said to me, you got to go to Algeria because Eldridge is there. And he wants to talk to you. And, you know, two days later, we were on a plane to Algeria. Now, that was quite a story, but I don't want to tell the whole thing here. So that was quite a story. So anyway, make a long story short, when we met at JFK, uh, you know, it was, uh, let's see, uh, who was there? Uh, Don Cox, big man. Uh, uh, what's her name? Kathleen Cleaver. Uh, and what was her, you know, who is the, the woman? Uh, I'll think of her name. She became a professor on the West Coast. Angela Davis? Uh, Angela Davis. Uh, and me. And my wife. And the day before, they all had these huge afros. And when we got to Canada, they had all shaven their afros. They were just like business people. And so I realized, oh, maybe this might be more serious than I thought. And when we got to Paris, they took me off the plane and held me for about four hours. And then they put me back on the plane. I went to, I said hello, I rejoined the group. And then they took me off the plane in Marseille. And there was another bunch of hours and finally I got to Algiers and I spent a few weeks in Algiers with Eldridge and the, and the boys and girls and uh, that was a pretty amazing time because they were planning a flash of lightning which was a kamikaze attack on the cops in Manhattan to take place in about four weeks Woo, who knew anyway and also, before I went in, the, he, had, he was in a house on the outskirts of town. Uh, I had to wait for usually an hour because there were a big black limousine in front of his place. 
two black limos. And I'd wait, and then eventually these really short North Koreans would come out and drive away, and then I'd be allowed in. So there was some pretty heavy stuff being planned at the time. Uh, but uh, I don't want to go too deeply. Well, it does stuff. seem like, of just bringing it back to the films, like that, that heaviness, you can feel it in Dealing or the Berkeley to Boston 40 Brick Lost Bag Blues. That film definitely takes a turn for the you know the the you know there's these characters who are taking on the cops the corrupt cops and well yeah it's more yeah, violent but in all than, fairness no, okay. in all fairness that, that michael Crichton and his brother doug wrote the book i rewrote certain scenes that are just the person the only personal stuff in the stuff you know when the guy's on the toilet reading toodle when he's having certain arguments with his girlfriend. Basically, I think I probably fucked up a good action film. Uh, but the truth of the matter was, is the FBI was all over me in New York, interviewing my friends and whatever. And I knew a flash of lightning was coming on June 19th. So I thought I was in potentially a lot of trouble. And John Calley at Warner Brothers, uh, well, I guess when I was doing the Revolutionary in London, I had a friend who had great hash. And there was a guy named Danny Risner who was running Warner Brothers in London, putting together co-production deals with the Europeans. And I turned Danny on to the hash that I had gotten. That was really great stuff. And then Danny went down to Cannes, where all the heads of Warner Brothers, all the executives were going to the festival, and they all got stoned out of their minds uh, in the public dining room. Uh, but they were, they were too big to be arrested. Anyway, I was home in Manhattan worrying about the FBI. I was walking around with an attache case full of money, a passport, you know, and I told people that you know, if this flash of lightning starts, don't even look for me. I'm, I'm getting right to Kennedy and getting out of the country. And it was right then that uh, Callie called me up and said, would I like to do a movie about pot? <laughs> I hadn't even read the book. I said, I'd love to do it. <laughs> he says, I'll be out on the next plane. And I got on the plane. I read the book on the plane. I didn't like the book that much. But, uh, you know, I figured if I'm making a Hollywood movie, I'd be kind of safe for a while. So that's really why I did that movie. <laughs> I feel like we've kind of tied the bow here because out of it and the revolutionary and then dealing, which I love that you did dealing to stay out of uh, to, to like protect yourself from the law. I love that is like that's oh, that's like a that could be the sequel to the November Men. When the director has to make a movie to to avoid the the negative attention he got for making the November Men, <laughs> and I guess that does bring me to one question. And I don't know if I don't know if you have anything to say about this, but in looking for you, in researching you, uh, you know, you have this Paul Williams name. There's a lot of other Paul Williams. We joked about it on the podcast, but it still feels like. Your films are harder to find than, I don't know, than the people you're working with, than their, you know, and their quality. Uh, it, it doesn't really make sense that, like, you make you have these films with actors who people love and are very interested in, and they're very, you know, they're compelling films. They're certainly the kind of films that you could write or talk about, uh, and yet. You're a very hard person to find. And do you feel like in some sense, I don't want to say, yeah, do you feel like there's, a, because the November men makes me paranoid when I was researching you, it gave me paranoid thoughts of, is this filmmaker too dangerous? And is that yeah. why we can't find him? Or is it really just that your name is not, is the same as a lot of other people and you don't care that much about getting it out there anyway? Well, you know, in all fairness, I think the films in general don't, you know, appeal to the lowest common denominator. Uh, 
and they're all quirky and a little off center and uh, you know and I, I they weren't very successful I mean Nunzio was very successful in Canada uh, the November Men, under the name Double Exposure, was pretty successful in Europe. Uh, out of it was held in the, you know, for three years, and instead of being the first high school movie, was you know the tenth. Uh, so you were making that in '66, and, and it came out in '69. Yeah, Got it. and then uh, the revolutionary you know, it took two years to make. And by the time it came out, everybody was so highly radicalized that they didn't want to see a movie which said, are you really ready to die for what you believe in? They all believed they were ready to die. They, did, they didn't like the idea that the film asked you to make a political choice on your own. Uh, and uh, so they weren't very popular. <laughs> so when they first came out, the films didn't do very well. And, uh, you know, we, uh, the money is the God, you know, these things didn't make money. Well, I guess that leads us to maybe the, the more profitable aspect of your film career, which was as a producer, like you, you, your company that you were, uh, the co-creator of gave us films from, Brian De Palma and from Terrence Malick. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just like your your career as a producer? Because it also seems like as a producer, you would also that would bring you into a, into contact with a lot of other directors, you know, creatives in the film business that you might not get if you were just a director working on your own. Is that the case? Well. Not really. What really, what really it was, I was very young. It was just me, Francis, and Marty that were making films at that point. There were no other young people making movies, really. And both Marty and Francis wanted to be, you know, Hollywood filmmakers. Uh, and I, I was, I was, I liked Truffaut movies better. Uh, anyway. I liked European movies better than American movies. I didn't like American movies. But anyway, there was really just Marty, me, and Francis. And we got to, I got, you know, Terry went to Harvard and Oliver Stone. And uh, uh, the, the, well, we, I used, when I went to Los Angeles to make Dealing, I know it's a crazy story, but the first woman I met was Margot Kidder. And we, fell in love the first time we met. And I started living with her almost as soon as I got to Hollywood. And her house on the beach every weekend was, you know, Marty and John Milius and uh, Harvey Keitel and uh, uh, Jill Clayburgh and uh, uh, who else was there? Uh, I'm like, oh, Brian De Palma. Uh, you know, we were all young and we were all trying to, you know, make it in the film business, except me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was his name? The guy did Saturday Night Live. Uh, is that John Avildsen as well? Or No, Avildsen was not part of it. Avildsen oh. was still a man. Um, but he did do, oh, that's another whole story, Avildsen. Avildsen just walked into a number of huge hits because... He was. He liked to shoot movies. He wasn't an intellectual. He wasn't a writer. He liked to make a movie. Joe was his first big hit. Yeah, it's and funny when you were talking about uh, not wanting to be asked if you'd be willing to kill, or I, it, I immediately hit on Joe as being sort of a kindred film to the revolutionary in that sense. Well, but Joe, Joe is a brilliant film written by Norman Wexler, and John just shot it, you know, and. Same thing with uh, Stallone when he wanted to do Rocky. He just needed a director, right? Um, and I love John, and I like him. For, you know, he's passed away now, but uh, he's a good guy. Um, but he just walked into a couple of giant. I mean, Joe was huge. I don't know if you realize that. 
Yeah. And then, of course, Rocky was huge. And then the Karate Kid was huge. I mean, it was just quite amazing. Uh, quite amazing. But anyway, by, I and knew his kind best of every... film, His best film wasn't huge. Neighbors from 1981. We love it on this <laughs> podcast. Anyway, I'm not. I'm kidding. I actually, I do, I do think Joe's a pretty great film. Uh, he's, he's also a great person. I, I like John very much. Yeah. Uh, but so you're so back to these parties at Margot Kidder's. Okay. Where well, no, it was not a party. It was a constant hangout all we uh, the whole weekend. You know, music and drugs and uh, carrying on, and everybody felt pretty hot. And you know, so I would tried to get. Brian was upset because Get to Know Your Rabbit was a failure, and Margot was uh, doing a TV series with James Garner, and uh, so we got them together to do Sisters. Uh, but it wasn't producing; it was because I was part of that crowd. I knew everybody, and by the way, I was very open. I would ha- introduce everybody to everybody. I was not competitive, and I was not trying to. Uh, I was trying to help everybody around me, frankly. And I've always been like that. So, uh, yeah, and so that's basically what happened. So that's how you were. You started with Brian De Palma. And how many films did Pressman Williams produce for De Palma? Well, when I was with him, two. Two. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then what about Terrence Malick? How did he come into the into that mix? Well, I mean, basically the same way with Oliver Stone is they came to me and said, what about, I need a producer. Both of these are very strong filmmakers, Oliver and Terry. And I said, look, Ed is the perfect producer for you. I mean, he, he's, you know, philosophy major at Stanford. He's this bright guy, but he's kind of shy. Uh, and he won't get in your way. You can you can run your own show with Ed. And the nice thing is, is that Ed looks, you know, ten years older than us, and everybody thinks he's a big businessman because this Pressman Toy Company. So he's a great buffer between you and the studio. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better producer uh, if you're a strong director, because he'll protect you. He'll argue with the studio. You don't have. You can always say, talk to the producer. And the, it's a hard thing having a, it's, it's tough to talk to. It's not that he's a bully or anything, but uh, he's a very good protector. And I told Oliver and Terry that, that Ed is a, a dream producer that way. What was the film that you were, what was the first film you worked on with Oliver Stone? Well, I didn't work. I mean, Oliver, it's like it was the hand he was going to do with Ed. Ah. He's going to do. The Michael Caine film that, yeah. So how did you did you know him? How did you know Oliver Stone? God, I knew everybody. What can I tell you? <laughs> you know, uh, did you know Lotus Weinstock? What Lotus Weinstock? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but what I mean to say is, you know. Well, do you read the book? So yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know I, I, I could sit here and ask you. I have a list of names that I want to just throw at you, like, and just tell me a story about Julie Christie. But I'm not no. going to do that right now. But I'm saying I have a list. You, yeah. your life, the people that you interacted with. Um, it's just like what what John Renoir said to you. It's like have an interesting life, have an interesting yeah. point of view, have stories that are like that. And I'm sort of teasing the story. You can tell it if you want. But I feel like that is one of the things that is so that as I've dug deeper into you as an artist, it's almost like the roads not taken or the right th- that they are part of the, st- the the richness of the story of the career. Well, you know, I think part of it is having gotten so much so early in life. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm from the Bronx. I was a poor kid. But, you know, by the age of 23, I was married to one of the richest families in the in the world. I was making Hollywood. You know, I was younger than Marty and Francis. They were old. They were 25, 28. I was 20, 23 years old. Uh, 
and I was a kid and I, you know, and I got to see what life was like with, you know, where money was unlimited and you could do anything you wanted. Uh, you know, and so on my own little level, I was far richer and far more famous than I ever thought I would be, you know, in the period of, you know, a couple of years. So, and I, I went through that for about six years, seven years. And I realized that, uh, I, I guess on some deep level, I became a Buddhist. You know, I really found that people were not happy, people that uh, money was not going to do it for me and fame was not going to do it for me. So basically, my job was to find out how I worked, how how the mind works, how this, uh, you know, how do you control it and understand it? And how do you have fun? <laughs> and how do you become objective? Uh, so my life really has, I think, has been a fairly straight quest for a certain uh, wisdom. And uh, I didn't waste the time, frankly, that most people do spending their whole lives trying to make some money or get famous or something. It, it just didn't do it for me. I didn't find the people particularly uh, fascinating or what they were trying to achieve worthwhile doing. I mean, when Lorne Michaels said, come on, let's do Saturday Night Live, I said, fantastic. Are we going to talk about the military industrial complex and the money behind all of these things? And he said, uh-uh, we're network. You know, I said, well, why are you going to want to spend your life doing that? Yeah, I, that's exactly what I'm talking about, is that there is, what is like, it's like uh, they call it crazy wisdom, right? <laughs> is yeah. It's a crazy thing to walk away from Saturday Night Live, but it's also it's to if to know that you have that in the bank of your character. It's like that wasn't that road was not for you, but the fact that you knew that it wasn't for you is a really it's a kind of a crazy wisdom uh, lesson. Well, you, in the West, in the West, we would call it crazy, but in the East, you would say, you know, that you're, you're, you're following your higher self rather than your ego structures. And frankly, I've been very, I've been very happy since around 1973, you know, uh, and I've run into some of my old buddies. They don't look happy to me. <laughs> I know you're not as you're not as active as a filmmaker, certainly as you were then. But are uh, you, hey, I'm a I'm a, I'm a hermit. Are you in conversation just about film with any of your former colleagues? No, I I'm not at all. I mean, from time to time, I'll maybe once every few years have a few sentences with Ed, but. Uh, no, I my I my best friends right now are you know one of them is a psychoanalyst and the others uh, a music producer, uh, and the others a writer, and uh, you know what we're interested in is not showbiz. I mean I don't see I mean I hate to be repetitious. I don't I get I, I get get things pretty quickly, so that's why I went I went to. A, I got high school. Oh, I got the revolutionary thing. Oh, I got the drug thing. Oh, I got the criminal thing. Oh, I got the drug thing. Oh, I got the holy thing. Oh, I, you know, uh, in other words, I, I always saw it. Uh, and from a very early age, it was before I made any of the movies. You know what I mean? It was right after Harvard. Mm -hmm. I went to London and I read all of Hemingway and Fitzgerald. You know, and that's all I did all day. And I realized that I wanted to, I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be a character. Yeah. And I wanted to make my life interesting for me. I saw how interesting life could be. And I would make my life more interesting than a movie, which I think I've done. But I may, I'm also not an important filmmaker. I, I appreciate your saying that because we all are 
you know, we all recognize ourselves for our failures, but I do feel like you are, I think there is importance to your filmmaking career that, uh, that as just an outside viewer who really just came to it as like someone who's loved the November men for a long time and then yeah. was having to do a podcast about it and didn't want to sound like an idiot. So I was like, okay, well, okay. I got to really find out who this guy is. Cause I, you show up in the November men and it feels like you're someone that I'm supposed to know, but I yeah. don't. And I guess, and I guess maybe I, that's where we come to, whereas we're getting towards the end of this epic interview, which is that that's that same sense of like, yeah, you're someone that if you care about the history of that time, if you care about film, the films of that era, I think you're someone that it's like you start, you come into that movie like this is someone you should know. And not to say there aren't probably, you know, 50 other people who we could also say that about or 100 other people or a thousand other people. But for me, I feel like, as you said, at start, it was you and uh, and Francis and Marty and there's so much attention to not just Coppola and Scorsese, but New Hollywood and that time. And it really does seem like you have a very particular viewpoint and experience with that. It's expressed in your memoir. Um, and I feel like it's just it's expressed in your filmography in a way that I feel like, well, I feel like I am hoping that that this conversation and podcast, the podcasts we're doing can draw more attention to it because I feel like not for your sake, I think you're doing fine, but for our sake as film goers and as a student. Hey, I, I, at this point in my, in my life, I, I, I would love to get, I don't even know an agent to go to for a book. I don't, uh, I, I need to create some commotion. Um, I was. I saw. There's a movie out now, or not a movie, a book. I think called 1973. Did you see it? I haven't seen that. No. Yeah. Anyway, some people tell me it's doing very well. It's all about the year that changed America culture, 1973, and a lot of the people we're talking about are in it. But I'd love to find out the name of the agent of the writer. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so when you look at that, at it, you're like. 1973, the year I walked away from the film business. <laughs> That's when <laughs> everything changed. I didn't. I came. I saw. I changed the landscape of film, and now I'm off to <laughs> hang out and you know and learn about tantra and uh, remote viewing and uh, you know dabble. But, uh, hey, there was company. also there was also plenty of uh, adventures uh, with. Uh, Life and death. Yes, I guess when uh, when we were at the, when we did the reading at the beginning and we were talking about John C. Riley's question for the Pop Oracle about do our dead relatives see us? It made me think of your story about your mother's passing and the way you documented it and sort of that was something you invested a great deal of time. Um, I don't know. Uh, right. I, I, there's another. That's a perfect example. I actually took a picture of, you know, did you look at the book at any? Oh, yeah. The image of a script. Oh, no. Uh, well, I, didn't I mean, see I can't believe that book, nobody so. was. I can't believe nobody got interested in it. That was hard to believe. But. Uh, well, tell the story of what happened. Oh, my God. I wrote a book about it. Uh, my mother died. And I knelt down to take pictures with my Blackberry of the two hospice workers who were cleaning her up and took a series of pictures uh, of them from down shooting up into their faces. And later, when I transferred the images to my laptop, I saw an um, you know, the image of a small person, <laughs> you, you know, so, if, you know, a spirit of some sort, but it wasn't amorphous and it wasn't uh, cloud-like. It was pretty, pretty uh, specific. And, you know, it was within an hour of my mother's dying. 
And I eventually ended up with Dean Radin, who's a very famous fellow in this area, uh, who's head of the uh, uh, Institute in Petaluma. Uh, I'll think of the name of it. Anyway, make a long story short, he's written many books. Uh, he used to be head of parapsychology at the CIA. Anyway. Uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Yes, that's the place. And I went to see him. He said, there's never been a picture that, that is that clear, and that sharp, that's in the same place as the dead person at the same time of the death. So, you know, for me, this was like mind blowing. Nobody's ever taken a picture. Of it. Let me try to, you know, and I went to the Harry Fareed, who's the authenticator of the Oswalds. You know, he's the world's leading authenticator of pictures for New York Times, sports, the, everybody. You got, you know, they have a foolproof technique to, to, to tell when doc, photographs are doctored. And he said, you know, this is the real thing. And I also, I went to all the experts and they all gave me these great testimonials. But I couldn't get anybody, I guess I've lost my flair for public relations. I mean, the reason we're having this thing is God knows is because you saw the movie and called me, thank goodness. But this is the first sort of, public event for me in many years. We hope to change that, to bring some more attention <laughs> to the filmography and to the book. Well, well, you know, I do think the book could get people interested in the film. I, I certainly hope so, and I'm hoping that this podcast will, will help bring some interest to both. There are a lot of people who are quite brilliant, who I guess it's because of Dilgo and Oscar and other people that you read about in the book. I really feel there is something more to be known about how to live your life and how to be happy and how to have a just society and how I just don't go along with this greed and ego business. You might even say that uh, you recognize that the world is wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's a, well said. You ought to do a show like that. That's, that's, yeah, I, that's probably why we went on for three hours here. Okay, I got to go to sleep, but... Uh, uh, wait, 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 two things I want to say. First, I want to say thank you. Uh, and it's really been a pleasure for me. And also stay in touch. One of the things I taught my daughter was, I said, look, before you meet somebody new, see how you're feeling. Check your feelings, because she knows the miser. So check your feelings out. And then after you leave them, see how you're feeling. If you're feeling better after you leave them than when you met them, that's a good person. So anyway, I've had, you're making me feel better. Radio 8 Ball. Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now, back to the show.
thank you for listening to this bonus episode of The World is Wrong podcast. We'll be back in September with Season 2, and if you'd like to hear the companion episode of Radio 8 Ball, the link is in the show notes. In the meantime, please subscribe to this podcast and share it with your friends. Leaving us great ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts is also a big help. If you want to ask any questions or share any thoughts, you can write to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com and find us online at www.theworldiswrongpodcast.com as well as on Instagram at the world is wrong podcast. Big thanks to Paul Williams for doing this interview and big thanks to you for checking it out. Until next time, I'm Andras Jones reminding you that Wherever you are, the world is wrong, and it's probably wrong about you.